Hello, welcome to Locked on Sharks, the premier hockey podcast of your favorite team in the Bay Area. On today's episode, we're going to learn, kind of dive deeper into the prospects. We have uh, Hattie on from the Locked on NHL Prospects channel, where he's going to talk about some of the uh, Sharks prospects in the OHL and in the queue. Then we're going to talk to some of the Barracuda guys, get a nice little the discussion on why Tristan Robbins is so good at shooting the puck. So all that and more on today's episode of Locked on Sharks. Your Locked on Sharks, your daily podcast on the San Jose Sharks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, J.D. Young, contributor at Fear the Fin, San Jose Hockey Now. I want to thank you for making Locked on Sharks your first listen for free and available wherever you get podcasts. And, of course, you can watch this on YouTube as well. So did this interview on Saturday uh, before um, my voice was gone. So I'll actually have a de- – my voice sounds normal in this uh, compared to the Kermit the Frog uh, sounding grotesque thing you hear right now. If you missed it, late episode dropped last night to recap the weekend and the cracks in the Sharks Foundation are starting to show. So go check out that. If you want to listen about more prospects and fun stuff, make sure you go check out Hattie's episode at uh, Locked On um, NHL Prospects, wherever you get podcasts. But um, let's get into it. All right. And now we bring in Haiti, the host of Locked On NHL Podcast. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing good. Um, you know, there's been lots of, of scouting uh, required over the last couple of days. So I've been pretty busy um, staying up, watching, you know, three, four uh, hockey games a night, just getting, you know, comfortable with the the 2023 class and also just sort of studying up on different prospects from different leagues. So, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I mean, the, this we haven't started our 2023 draft class, but this draft class is shaping up to be in insane draft class just with of course with the top end talent but just also how deep this draft class is but mm-hmm. wanted to get you on because uh you know the q you know the o you know the, those uh leagues very very well get you actually get to watch them a lot more than i do so i wanted to bring you on kind of uh talk about some of the these diet guys who are you know some of the sharks prospects so Let's start with with uh, Ethan Cardwell. So Cardwell was one of the last kind of cuts for the Barracuda before going back. Um, he's had a pretty solid season. He's got 27 points so far um, this year. What have you seen from from Cardwell um, as an overager uh, playing with with, uh, with Barry this year? Yeah, so he was drafted as an over overager as well by the Sharks uh, in 2021. Um, there's a lot of little pro habits that I really like with with Ethan Cardwell. He he's very tenacious, very intense on the forecheck. He backchecks really well. Um, you know, he has a relentless motor. Uh, you know, going both sides of the ice. What's also you know interesting to me is that he's added some transition value over the last couple of years. It was an an issue in his draft year. I felt like it wasn't involved enough in transition. You know, carrying pucks up the ice and all that. But he's actually been a pretty decent transition driver for the Barry Colts so far. Um, he's strong along the boards and in front of the net. You know, there's there's a lot of little pro things that he does really well. Um, so I think his game is going to translate very well to the to the pro game. I just I think that. You know, I'm not really sold on the puck skills with Cardwell. Mm-hmm. I think that his shot's a bit lacking. I think that his stick handling does need some work. Um, but I'm pretty sure that this is a player who's going to offer bottom six value to the Sharks down the road. This is the type of guy that you can plug in your lineup. He's going to add a lot of energy, a lot of physicality. His play along the boards is really tremendous. He's able to get, you know, He's, he's able to turn 50 50 battles into 70 30 battles um mm. just by using his body well you know using a center of gravity to um you know position himself well along the boards to maximize his chances of getting pucks so all that's going to sort of compound and lead to, to decent results i think at the pro level and then some of the other guys from that 2021 uh kind of draft class you had max McHugh and liam gilmartin who were both when they were picked they were part of london um 
uh, Gil Martin was traded to Erie at the start of the season. Um, mm-hmm. Let's start with, with him. How is, I know he was a little bit slow getting started with them, um, you know, new system, but it seems like he's kind of come along. What have you seen from, from Liam Gil Martin? Yeah, so Gil Martin is pretty is a pretty interesting case because there was discussions about potentially, you know, about him potentially going to uh, Providence College in the NCAA, but he ended up going the OHL route. Um, what I see from Gil Martin, I mean, he for me was sort of a third, third or fourth rounder kind of range prospect because again, there's a lot of translatability. That's one thing that's kind of a um, connecting uh, element between the three OHL guys is they, they've all got pretty sort of. Uh, pro ready things they've got a lot of intensity and a lot of that stuff i think that what gil martin brings is he's first he's big at six 295 200 pounds he's very hard working um but again just just like cardwell i think he's got just about average puck skills i mean his habits are pretty good he cuts to the inside a lot he overpowers his opponents uses his size and his frame to his advantage but um the puck skills are just about a baseline, something that's that's going to keep him, I think, at the pro level. I don't think he's going to sort of flunk out of that level of competition, mm-hmm. but it's not something that's going to help him thrive and reach top sixes and, and stuff like that. I think he's, you know, a pretty safe bet to sort of reach the NHL in some capacity, probably as a fourth liner. Um, there's also, you know, I, I tried to catch a game of his recently and I realized that he got a 10 game suspension for abusive officials. So that was pretty interesting. I wasn't able to find any information on what exactly happened or what he said, but yeah, he's, he's out until new year's Eve. So not, not a lot of chances to get, you know, sights on him recently. Um, mm-hmm. but again, I saw a third or fourth rounder in him. So to get him in the sixth round, you know, that's pretty good value from the sharks. If you can get an NHL out of your sixth rounder, I mean, you've You're got value there. That. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And then Max McHugh, um, I know he's also been out recently too. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, with London, they they like to produce those guys out. But he doesn't seem. I was I was kind of expecting him to kind of maybe jump into one of the kind of top line roles with them. And mm-hmm. he seems to kind of be floating between that second third line with them. Uh, what have you seen with with McHugh? So McHugh, I didn't have on my radar at all in 2021. He didn't play at all actually because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I don't think he's developed really into anything particularly impressive either i've watched a lot of london hockey this year um you know they've got denver barkey who who's in the 2023 class logan mayu who's you know part of my responsibilities at uh habs eyes on the prize so you know i've, I've gotten a lot of tape on him and, and gotten a lot of viewings and he's just he's he's always struck me as just sort of a decent sized guy who can skate well it's got some intensity to his game I think there's a significant lack of forethought to the way that he processes the game, and that's mm. going to limit it. That's going to limit its game, you know, a lot. And when you have that lack of forethought, some players are good enough in terms of their puck skills to overcome that. So they overcome bad habits and bad processing by just being really good on the puck, um, or being big enough, or strong enough, or fast enough to to sort of overcome that. He's kind of just sort of average in those sort of ranges, so I, I don't, I wouldn't expect the most out of McHugh. I think if you get an NHL out of him, it's it's a, it's, it's pretty much the best outcome that you can expect. But I, I wouldn't see him as any, you know, I, I don't see top nine potential um, in his game. But he does have some runway. He's still sort of 19, 20 years old. He's got you know a lot of development ahead of him. So you never know. But my assessment from him so far is he's sort of an in, an OHL scorer who's going to be able to you know, produce even better next year when some of the guys that are there leave the organization and he gets more ice time. But yeah, no, I, I just, I'd be surprised if you got an NHL or out of McHugh. And if you do, it's probably in a, in a bottom line capacity. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, he's again, you're on a very talented team and he just seems to yeah. not be able to kind of crack the, the top end of the talent type of there. So um, yeah, yeah I, I think he's probably going to be kind of an AHL guy and mm-hmm. who might, yeah, might sneak up and play a couple of games in the NHL here and there. So sure. I guess before we continue with uh, Haiti and talk about Tristan Robbins, what makes him so special, all that fun stuff. Take a quick break. Let you guys know about our friends over at Simply Safe. Today's episode is brought to you by Simply Safe. At Locked Sharks, we believe home is where you and your family should feel safest, especially over the holidays. This season, give yourself and your family the gift of peace and protection with the number one rated home security system, Simply Safe. And right now, Simply Safe is offering Locked On Sharks listeners forty percent off a new security system. Don't put this off, okay? You want to take care of this. Take care of your house. 
take care of your possessions, take care of your loved ones. So great thing about him is the app. Anytime you can pull up the app, look at the HD security cameras, see what's going on in your house. Anytime you're at a Christmas party, you're out Christmas shopping, you're out just doing stuff, you have it there. They have 24-7 professional monitoring service that costs under a dollar a day. Less than half price of traditional home security systems. That way you know if something happens, they're going to contact you. They're going to help cover your stuff, cover your family, keep you protected. So don't miss your chance to say big. Get 40% off on any new system at simplysafe.com slash locked on NHL. That's simplysafe.com slash locked on NHL. There's no safe like simply safe. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and then Jake Furlong, who the, the Sharks picked to the defenseman um, in the queue playing for Halifax. So Halifax is an absolute monster who just dominates people. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I know points aren't everything, but you would expect on a team that scores as much as, as it does, he would be a little bit more of a point producer. Um, have, what have you seen from him? I know, I know it's a little bit hard with defensemen in the queue because it's the queue. Uh, but what yeah. have you kind of seen from him? So, yeah. So you've touched on something um, there with you know scouting queue defensemen. Honestly, most of the time when I see a QMJHL defenseman, it's automatically sort of a red flag to me because that league doesn't really um, teach the right things in terms of in-game scenarios to defensemen. There's a lot of cheating that happens. There's a lot of, you know, not checking your surroundings. Um, you know, the way players, you know, even the way forwards move at the, at the QMJHL level is just not anything near what what it's like at the pro level. There are a tiny bit more similarities in the OHL and the WHL than in mm-hmm. the Q. The thing with Furlong is not much that he does is NHL translatable. So mm-hmm. first he shoots from a standstill at the point instead of sort of deceiving, you know, creating a shooting lane for himself, moving along that blue line, trying to, you know, rotate things a bit in order to create some chaos. He just kind of, he gets the puck and he can shoot from a standstill. I think that his puck skills from the point are pretty good, but he doesn't u- utilize them in the right way. So that's already a, a habit that isn't translatable to the NHL. He can't really keep up with opponents off the rush when they hit that second gear, when they when they reach their top speed. His pivots are really slow, so he has trouble sort of pivoting and keeping up with rushing forwards as they come into the offensive zone. He's gotten, you know, he's gotten blown past a couple times. Uh, in the games that I've watched uh, for the Halifax Mooseheads. Again, this is a high-scoring team, and it's kind of benefiting his game. There are some deceptive flashes in his game, but he doesn't Mm -hmm. utilize them in the right areas and in the right ways. So for me, there isn't really anything that screams NHL defenseman about Furlong, but you know, you you could get a third pair to a defenseman out of him. I think he's got enough um, deceptive elements. He's got enough puck skills. I think his shot's pretty good. Um, it, you know, his shot's good because it's a result of him taking low danger shots. So having to work on his strength and, and the heaviness of his shot in order to, to score goals, you know, he relies on those elements. So, you know, even despite himself, these things are going to improve in his game. He's going to have a stronger shot every time he takes one. Yep. But that's about it for Furlong. I, I don't really see any high end upside in this sense, um, especially the way that he processes a game and, and the habits that he has. It's just it's it's not a combination that drives the play positively at the NHL level. But again, it's it's early in his development. There's a lot of runway ahead of him and defensemen tend to develop late. So I'm not too worried in this case. Okay. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. Let's get into some of the Barracuda guys. So I know you we were we were chatting a little bit offline. Um about you know kind of Eklund and Bordalo and Tristan Robbins and you were talking about how much of a huge fan you are of Tristan Robbins and we were kind of discussing about like how how his shot is so deceptive and how quickly he he gets it off so um why don't why don't you lay on why what makes Robbins so special in that department yeah so the thing that really works so well with Tristan Robbins um, and his his goal scoring is, you know, he's not the biggest guy. He's not the strongest guy. But you look at his shooting mechanics and they're extremely refined. And it goes beyond just one or two types of shots that he likes to pull off. He's got a very wide arsenal of shots. And that makes him even tougher to contain and prevent from getting shots off. The reason he gets shots off so quickly is because of his skating. So his skating is so 
well refined in terms of his edge work, in terms of his weight transfer, his mechanics. He's able to to go from full stride to to shooting a puck in in perfect motion, um, almost seamlessly, almost flawlessly. Mm. And it's something that he doesn't really struggle with a lot. Um, you know, it's very rare for a player to be able to shoot off his off leg, you know, off the outside edge of his off leg, you know, that fluidly and that quickly. It's it's something that Connor Bedard does really well, and that's what makes him such an effective goal scorer. Um, it's just the ability to to shoot off balance, to shoot, you know, off his outside edge, on his off leg, and just it, there's no way to contain that type of goal scoring. I don't think Robbins is going to be a 40, 50 goal scorer, but I, I'm pretty confident that Tristan Robbins could absolutely score 30 at the NHL level with enough time to develop his game, round out the the mechanics of, you know, his board battles, the the way that he, he you know, the angles that he takes in the offensive zone in order to maximize his chances of getting mm-hmm. pucks in dangerous areas and, and being able to fire him off quickly. I really like the way that Robin shoots mechanically. It's, it's just really sound, really solid, and should translate pretty well to the NHL level. Yeah. And Robbins has been mostly playing with the, on the Barracuda recently. He's been playing with Bordalo and he's been playing with Eklund Two mm-hmm. very smart, high IQ. I know where to find guys, even if I can't see them. And it yeah. seems like Robbins has been able to uh, kind of benefit from that. I know they got broken up recently. Uh, mm-hmm. That line got broken up recently, but you've seen like Eklund playing with Robbins or you've seen Bordalo playing with Robbins. And Robbins has kind of been, I mean, Robbins is a great player in his own, but he's been kind of been able to, you know, kind of capitalize on some of their, what those guys do well and combine that with, with what uh, Robbins does well, which is shoot the living crap out of the puck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And I think, you know, the thing that makes, uh, especially William Eklund, such a great fit for Tristan Robbins is Eklund is an extremely smart, extremely heady player. He he scans the ice constantly, and with Robin's ability to move and weave in and out of pockets in order to find space, that combination could be really lethal because Eklund constantly knows where Robbins is because he's constantly checking his shoulders. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Robbins has the finishing ability to be able to fire a puck wherever he gets it. He has a very wide wheelhouse, so it's not like the puck needs to be in any specific spot for him to be able to shoot it really well and, and shoot it quickly. He can find pucks that are behind him by quite a lot and sort of uh, drag them into his wheelhouse for a shot. So the combination of Eklund's intelligence and scanning you know, habits and Tristan Robbins off puck positioning and goal scoring, it's something that reminds me a lot of um, the one-two punch in Montreal of, of Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield. And that's what makes them work so well off each other is, you know, one is extremely smart, scans the ice a lot, knows exactly where his teammate is at all times. And the other is just, you know, one of the best players finding, you know, space off the puck, freeing himself up and and creating goal scoring chances. So with Robbins and Eklund, you see a very similar sort of trend where, you know, as they develop chemistry, as they play more and more together, you're going to see these guys find each other on the ice consistently. You add on top of that Bordelow's intensity, his his, uh, his ability to create space for his teammates and then to exploit that space, that that trio, if you keep them together in the AHL and then graduate them all together and make them your second or third line off the bat, I mean, oh boy. That, that's that's a winning combination. <laughs> I, I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm like this, this, is, this trio of players could do damage at the NHL level together if they continue to develop chemistry and if they're graduated together, if they, they create that bond um, where they constantly know where each other are at all times on the ice, this this could be a lethal combination for the Sharks down the road. All right, guys, before we finish up, do want to let you guys know about the Locked On Sports Today podcast. If you guys haven't checked it out already, they've got you covered with the biggest takes, all the biggest stories. You know, right now you got baseball, hot stove heating up, Please, Aaron Judge, please, please come to the Bay. Come to the Giants. Come home. You got football playoffs. We're races getting going. They've got you covered. Locked on Sports Today, biggest stories in sports, wherever you find your podcasts. And, of course, you can watch on YouTube as well. So a lot of Sharks fans have been, I want to say frustrated, but it feels like they're like, well, Eklund and Bordalo, like they're not kind of tearing up their AHL. They're doing fine. You know, they're mm-hmm. they're among the leaders in goal scores, at least among rookies and mm-hmm. on the Barracuda team, which 
if you look at the scoring, it's you, it's like Andre Casino, and then it's a bunch of the rookies, right? Yep. Patience, right? <laughs> tell tell the people be patient. They're doing just fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, there, there's there's only so much you can do as a rookie in the AHL when you know you've been playing at different levels your whole life, especially if you've been playing junior up until that point. I mean, the only one who's played any pro hockey before getting to the AHL, I'm pretty sure, is William Eklund. And yeah. it's, a, it's did such... get a couple games. He got not eight at the end of the season, but still, he yeah. did. He did, yeah. yeah. But like long term, in terms of playing a whole season, I think that Eklund is the only one who played like a full SHL season before you know coming over. And even then, the SHL is just a completely different league than the AHL. I'd say that it's a tougher league to get scoring in, but it's a it's an easier league to get away with um, defensive liability and stuff like that. The AHL is very fast paced, very turnover um, based, and that makes it really difficult for rookies to keep up with play at a high enough level. Um, you saw it with players, you know, one example I like to give of like a, a good development story is how the Maple Leafs treated um, the William Nylanders and, and Mitch Marners, um, how they let them marinate for a bit in, in with the Marlies, you know, as mm -hmm. their team was developing, you know, a, a, a losing habit in, in, in the NHL, you know the Leafs couldn't win a game to save their life in 2015, 2016. And that's how they got yeah. Austin Matthews. Um, so letting the, the young guys marinate, marinate in the AHL, develop chemistry, understand each other well. And winning habits, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's just developing yes. winning habits are so essential to be able to, to make things happen at the next level. So I always preach patience when it comes to rookies in the AHL. There's no reason to rush Bordalo. I know he played last year. I, I know that, you know, he's got, he's gotten mm -hmm. his, his share of an, an NHL attempt, but there's no, there's no reason at all to be able to, to, to sort of worry about them not scoring at this current level. Cause it's a very difficult level to score. And as a rookie, um, it's extremely physical as well, which is something that they might not exactly be used to at this point. So just adapting to that and being ready for the next step so they can dominate a bottom six in the NHL and then work their way up. It's essential. I think this is this is key development time for these three guys. Yeah. And, and we, I had this conversation with uh, Laura from locked on Canadians uh, last week about like, we we've seen that with like the, the sends, right. They had a bunch of guys and they kind of just like, okay, go play NHL minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And they, they scored well and stuff, but like, now when there's like actual expectations for them like a lot of these guys don't have like those kind of habits you know like those mm -hmm. kind of winning habits and stuff and now when things are bad um they don't really know what to do to kind of get the, themselves out of this winning way you know into a, a winning type of way and it's, i know it sounds kind of cliche and stuff like oh just these winning you know habits and stuff but mm -hmm. when you've been kind of given the keys to the kingdom at a young age or the keys to the card at a young age and it's like Oh, now we have to learn how to play winning hockey. It, it's it's a little bit hard to do, right? Hundred percent. And you know, winning habits usually comes down to you know, managing confidence and managing, um, you know, understanding that you're never out of a game. Because mm -hmm. you know, there's two things that lead to sort of losing habits. First is taking your foot off the pedal when you're up, and and second, it's either trying too hard or not trying hard enough when you're down. Um, just being able to manage poise essentially is what I'm referring yeah. to being able to stay poised and compose in pressure situations. That is what creates winning habits. That's what creates wins for a team. Um, you know, teams with a long history of winning, like, um, you know, the, the Tampa Bay lightning who were pretty close to creating a, a you know, a dynasty. Um, they have an, a very, very good AHL team that, yep. Is, is, is really, really strong at developing players, at creating, you know, co composed, smart, you know, pro-ready players. So when they reach that NHL level and they have to, to replicate the habits that, you know, they were developing in the AHL, it's easy because mm -hmm. it's nothing different. The, the goal of your of your minor team is to replicate your NHL team as much as, as closely as possible so that the, the transition is as seamless as, as it can be. So... I think what the Barracuda are doing right now is 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 trying to develop something that isn't present in San Jose right now. And that's a bit more difficult, but if you can manage create a winning environment in San Jose and bring in the right people, surround these young prospects with with a lot of, you know, solid foundations, you're you're pretty well set to have a more successful future. Yeah, and you know, we we've seen with the the Sharks where 
this off season, everything changed, right? You know, you have mm-hmm. a new general manager, you have a new head coach, you have a new uh, head coach in the AHL. Like yep. they, it takes a while for this stuff to kind of start to kind of show it, show its roots and for the roots to kind of hold. And yeah. 100%. So yeah, I, I'm not worried about, I know people are like, they're scoring, they're not scoring. And you know, with prospects, it's like, Oh, if they're not scoring a hat trick every night, then, or they could be scoring a hat trick, you know, but it's like, what else are they doing? And I think yeah. that's, that's what you're seeing, especially from William Eklund right now, where mm-hmm. he's playing, you know, first line minutes, he's playing top penalty kill. He's playing top power play. It's the, if you're not scoring, what else can you do for me type of thing? And especially when you get to the NHL where, Again, that that's that's that was kind of the issue last year with, with mm-hmm. when you got sent back to this NHL was if you're not scoring, what can you do for me? And if you want to play in the NHL, you got to be able to do all this other stuff. It doesn't matter if you're the first overall pick or you know you're an undrafted guy. Like you have to be able to kind of fill a role for a team. And I think Eklund is working on filling all that stuff out right now, and I think he's on his way to 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 doing that right now. So. Yeah, no, progress over production has always been my mantra with prospects. As long as you're pro- progressing in your game, doesn't matter what the points are, you know, it, it's good, you know, in the positive sense where you can have, you know, a, a player like Jaden Struble on the Habs who has four points in maybe 16 games in the NCAA, but it's actually progressing, so it doesn't matter. And it's it's also true in the bad sense where you've got players like Logan Mayu who are sort of tearing up the OHL but aren't really progressing in terms of their games. So, you know, for me, what matters more is progress at all times. That will always sort of take the the forefront over production. I'm getting my own prospect uh, jumping into the uh, the, <laughs> the podcast here. Um, yeah. All right, speaking about the, some of the the prospects, um, we haven't really started the 2023 draft, but um, who are some of? I mean, we we know of course about the Bedards, the Fantillies, like all the kind of the top guys. Who are some of the top guys like in the OHL that we should keep an eye on? I mean, I know the Sharks are probably going to be picking top five, top ten ish, uh, but just kind of some of the guys to, to kind of for our listeners to start kind of learning these names and, and kind of uh, getting get start getting a, a peek ahead. So, yeah. So in the OHL, um, first and foremost, it's really the WHL this year that has like everyone w that it's so worth some. This year. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness, it's it's insane. I think like for me right now, there's uh, one, two, three four whlers in the top 10 and you know at least seven or eight more in the top 32 but the main guy from the ohl who i think has sort of stood out above everyone else in terms of upside this year is callum ritchie uh, mm-hmm. of the oshawa generals ritchie is so intense but also so intelligent he understands the ice so well um he might he might be one of the one of the if, if not the most intelligent prospects in, in the draft the mm. stack that's this one um I, I love his processing, his scanning habits, his understanding of the ice, his his anticipation, you know, everything that goes into hockey sense for me, you have with Callum Ritchie. So he's one of the 10 guys who I think have top line upside um, in, in this year's draft. Other than Callum Ritchie, I think the next OHL guy on my list has to be uh, Colby Barlow. Who's just, he's sort of the, the, he's, he's like a modern day power forward. I've got him 14th overall in my personal rankings. And I see a lot of, of Josh Anderson in him, but some he's elements. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I will not comment on an underage uh, <laughs> player, Fair. but like in terms of his, his ability to power to the net, to create shots, to, to just constantly be on third gear. Um, but I also think he's got more and like a lot more intelligence than, than Josh Anderson. Anderson to me, just if, if he makes a, if he makes a cross ice pass for me, I'm like pinching myself. It's a miracle with Corby <laughs> Barlow. It's like, it's like, it's, it's actually a, a pretty decently common thing. Other than that, Quentin Musty, I think has one of the most, um, expansive tools, tool sets in the, uh, you know, in the 2023 draft, if his brain can just keep up with his hands, if you can actually sort of show signs of intelligence, of advanced understanding, you're set. And then one guy I really want to shout out, because um, he's a personal favorite of mine, I have him so much higher than everyone else is Luca Pinelli of the Ottawa 67s. Um, one of the smartest players of the draft. He just, he can, he understands his teammates so well and adapts to them so well. Um, he's not the fastest and he's not the tallest. That's 5'9", 160 pounds. But man, that, he's got a, an NHL hockey brain on him. 
That's good. Oh, I mean, it's short king season anyway, and we yep. uh, like the sharks. We love the short kings, as as yeah. So between mm-hmm. Portolo and Robbins and Eklund, we have plenty of short kings to uh, Hell yeah. to to praise. So, mm-hmm. um, Katie, you've said it all. Where can the people find you? Uh, where can they find your show? Of course, yes. What do you got? Yes, cooking? <laughs> of course. So you can find me on Twitter at Hattie K underscore Scouting. Um, I post all of my podcasts. You know articles mm-hmm. uh, draft rankings all that stuff on uh, on my personal twitter you can find locked on nhl prospects on youtube just by looking up the name uh we're on spotify odyssey apple Podcasts, all of your favorite podcasting platforms and on twitter as lo underscore nhl prospects all right guys i hope you enjoyed my conversation with hattie um expect him back on really as, as we start to uh, eventually dive into the draft and you know, of course, with the draft, you know, guys know how we do the draft here at Lockdown Sharks. Um, it's our only hope. So we we are going to, especially this 2023 draft, it's going to be insane. So um, this is the year. If you want to get in the draft, this is the year to get in the draft. It's going to be like the most ridiculous draft ever. So um, make sure you're going to go check out the Locked On NHL Prospects podcast wherever you get podcasts, of course. Um, watch on YouTube as well. Go ahead, hit the subscribe button. You're not going to miss it. So. Um, you can of course follow me on Twitter at my fry hole, follow the show, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at locked on sharks. Be back, uh, tomorrow, get you guys ready for the Canucks game. Then we get some of the time next week. We'll be able to kind of dig into some other topics surrounding the sharks. So, um, make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Odyssey, all those places watch on YouTube as well. And we'll be back tomorrow until then. Bye, friends.